Hello, you're listening to Sam J Has Questions. I am your host, Sam J. Thank you for being here today. You did not have to be here. I hope wherever you are, you're having a great day, whether it's in your car, you're listening at the gym, you're uh, listening uh, on your walk, I don't know, wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you for doing it. Thank you for, thank you for taking the time to, you know, to put aside your own thoughts, because let's 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 be honest, it can be in the background, but I'm hoping what I'm saying is really reaching you in the foreground. I don't think I'm gonna leave this in. I definitely won't leave this in. I'm a little rusty. I haven't put out an episode in a while. I haven't done an intro. Not gonna lie, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a feeling a little bit of the Tin Man. You know when he's like, and they oil him up. So we're gonna get oiled up. Nope, that's not. Ah, I'm dig. I'm doing worse. I'm doing worse. Definitely not gonna leave this in. Anyways, my interview today is with director, storyteller, writer Frank Ponce. Frank is a good friend of mine. We were we were working together in the trenches in production, and I knew I wanted to have him on the podcast. So enjoy the episode. listening or watching sam j has questions my guest today is mr frank ponce yes ponce is it ponce, ponce de leon ponce yeah i've always said it's funny like in second or third grade i couldn't make up a mind so i would kind of like mess with people some people would you know the american version i guess it would say is ponce i've been kind of like americanized yeah. but my grandpa would like shake his fist at me i was like no it's ponce ponce yeah he's mexican he give me like that stern actually it's not yeah, Ponce. It doesn't have like the. It doesn't have a. The, uh, what's it called? A tilde? I think it's one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. At the end of it or whatever. But that's what my grandpa always said. He was like, it's Ponce. Okay. Me. Yeah, so. Ponce. Yes. Frank Ponce. And um, just real quick, uh, a little bit about yourself, just what you're, what you are currently doing. Yeah. Uh, what you. Yeah, what is it that you that fills your time? Yeah. So I always. Uh, I call myself like, I guess, a cinematic storyteller. Just, uh, I mean, by trade, I'm a filmmaker, but I mean, I've sold a script uh, to Universal a couple years back on uh, Evil Knievel, worked on that for a full year, actually technically worked on that for like three and a half years, almost four years. Uh, it was in development for quite a long time, a little thing called uh, Development Hell <laughs> is what it's called. Yeah. Uh, it's going to happen. It's in the hands of another writer, though, as things tend to happen in this town whenever things aren't going right. Um, it's a long story. We're more, I'm more than happy to talk yeah, about that here. Yeah, you're, you're yeah. able to. Um, That'd be fun. Yeah, they're going into production uh, next month, as a matter of fact, and they're shooting out in uh, New Mexico. So it should be on Whoa. air sometime next year. I'm getting a producer credit. We're figuring out the right producer credit to get into. Um, so, yeah, prior to that, I, I, uh, I just wrote a shit ton of scripts. Um, actually, I've never really left this area for like the past six to seven years. It's kind of insane. Like, it's just insane. Like a couple floors down, I used to work out uh, from this place called Jump Cut. It was a social media production company for a while before they switched gears to be uh, an online education program. Like, well, they got different programs. Um, and I kind of left around that when they were making that transition. Shot a couple of their courses. But um, yeah, that's when I ended up going to uh, work on Evil for full time, I guess for about a year and a half. Okay. And, uh, and then prior to jump cut, um, what I did was I was across the street at the arc light Hollywood. I was a projectionist there, uh, was one of like six or seven projectionists at the time. Now they're down to like four or five, uh, just cause like the nature of everything now, it's not 35 millimeter. Everything's oh, okay. you know, digital. Just so it's just, play. yeah, it's just literally just pressing play now. So you were changing yeah. reels over. And yeah, stuff? man. I was, in, I, I'm the last of the Mohicans of, of that. Yeah, man, it was insane. And I had the night shifts doing that. So during the day I would go out, um, you know, try to make like short films happen or try to make like, uh, you know, I was hustling. I was hustling every way possible, making like uh, like short film content or short content for other folks like entrepreneurs. I think, you you know, um, should I say that? Like who? Yeah, I was in a, I was in a start kind of from the from the where we beginning? met each other. Yeah. OK. Get to that. But I think. Yeah. Yeah. Just where we first met was uh, through a mutual friend of ours, Adrian Rodriguez. Yes. Uh, we were I was working with Adrian at Alan Gordon and I met you through a project that he had asked me if I wanted to act in. Yep. I don't know if there was anything before that, but that was my first memory of meeting you. Yeah. 
So it was some sort of a spec commercial for Playboy TV. Yeah, it was. And yeah. I always like telling people <laughs> that I that I was in something of that nature. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I was nude, you know, even oh, yeah. though it was not. Yeah, <laughs> it was not nude, but it's no. fun to tell people that. Yeah. Uh, and I don't remember if we worked on anything after that of that side, but I definitely started hanging out with you and Adrian Moore. Yeah. And then 2016 started working for Ty Lopez when Adrian uh, left Alan Gordon. Yep. He brought me over. Yeah. And then I started working with you, yeah. uh, shooting stuff for Ty. And yeah. uh, in that world of the entrepreneur sort of 24 yep. seven content, yep. you know, we need video people everywhere. Yep. It's evergreen right now. Like there's, a, there's huge demand. Yeah. I get is hit it up. done? Is it? Is it no, no, no. It, I get hit up all the time. Like I got hit up to like try to edit some stuff right now and I've got other things I'm doing. So I'm, what I'm doing is I feel like I should be an agent or something at this point. Like I've got a whole bunch of different editor friends or filmmaker friends that can take the stuff that I don't have the bandwidth. So say if I don't have the bandwidth to shoot something or edit something for someone else, I give them off to someone else. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, I feel like I don't know. It's like, it's called like being a film entrepreneur, I guess now where it's like, you can work for on other entrepreneurs. You work for like, you know, I, the way I look at it is it's just like, it's just like commercial clients. Like that's just, this a whole new, you know, uh, I don't know what you, what you would call it, but I guess it's like a whole new, I guess gold, evergreen gold mine for, for filmmakers or anybody that's trying to make it out here, you know? Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people asking for content. Content is king these days, guys. So can you say that's, it into that camera? And yeah, just make content sure a... is king. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, that word is, it's used, it's thrown around a lot and we are in a podcast studio and, and podcasts are everywhere. Everyone has a, some sort of a podcast and different companies are right. purchasing podcast networks and right. TV is, coming from podcasts and TV and then podcasts are talking about TV. So it's like this weird world of like, there's never, it never stops in a way. Like there's just always people's attention yeah. that is for the taking. So I know one of the questions I wanted to ask was with how people are sort of engaged in their phones all the time and, and sh you know, shorter videos are scrolling through Instagram. How has that sort of changed your approach to telling your stories? Like, Oh, that's a good question. That's a really good question. I think it depends on who the, uh, who I'm telling the story for. And I look, I try to like, I figure it out. I figure out like, uh, it's very much like a, it's kind of like what an ad man would do back in the day, sixties or seventies, like mad men. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's totally different, you know, uh, generation and whatnot. So say if like, for example, um, a good, a good example of this, I'm thinking of that. I was like, man, okay, this is, this is, this might be better for long, long form, or this might be better for short form. Um, I remember, uh, I'll just tell, I'll just talk about one of them right now. Like okay. I, like when I was working downstairs, just, I haven't been here in a couple of years since. So it's kind of like, oh wow. Like I'm reliving a lot of memories here. It was just like, oh, I remember Just the that. entrance. And yeah. Yeah. The yeah. Building. Cool. Yeah. So one of the channels we had was a channel called Simple Pickup. It's no longer around. It's defunct. Uh, but at the height, I think it was at 2.8, 2.9 million subscribers. And uh, one of the first things I did was broker a deal with DraftKings to do this uh insane pickup uh with helicopter with a helicopter involved and it was like 2016 17 i think it was 2016 15 or 16 when getting one of those years and uh we wanted to you know we knew it was going to be strictly for youtube i, kn I knew it was going to be you know for anything else so i was like okay we got like in that time it was like five minutes five like five minute sweet spot now it's like i think youtube's like 10 minutes or longer right where like the, al the algorithm is forever changing so that's the first lesson i learned was like know what the algorithm is to whatever platform you're using so um you know me and this other producer we kind of had a checklist of all the you know all the things we had to kind of tick off to, like kind of, in order to crack you yeah what your limits were or just yeah. requirements of yeah 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 that was like one of the first things we were thinking because like this was a pretty, pretty big budget uh youtube shoot uh in in those days um these days every, everything's kind of insane thanks to like you know uh who's that guy right now mr beast you know he's up the ante with like i don't know million dollar giveaways he's giving yeah. insane giveaways and stuff now this is before giveaways was a thing so um yeah i guess it just uh so that was that was a lesson i learned i guess it's not like my um summary is just like know the algorithm a little bit to what your platform whatever platform you're using and kind of like tap into that so i wouldn't use the same like right now tip top 
TikTok is popping right now, like I wouldn't do the same same thing I was doing on YouTube. You know, I, w- I would speak differently on, on TikTok. There's like shorter attention spans. Mm-hmm. So, um, and then uh, I guess one of the other things I see, so I like this. I'm a silent assassin, is what I guess you would call it, because I've worked with a whole bunch of bigger YouTubers and whatnot. I remember doing a, a video for Vitaly. That was a long one. I was like a, a ten minute uh, video called why I did porn. It was kind of like, you know, Whoa. that's, that's the catchy, ta- that's a catchy title, right? What? Yeah. Called why I did porn. I mean, it was like no secret. Everybody kind of knew Vitaly is like, he's probably one of the biggest, uh, if not the biggest like prankster on YouTube. Right. And, um, uh, I remember this was something that was always kind of talked about. Like he was friends with us at jump cut and, uh, everybody kind of knew it was like an elephant in the room. He was like, Oh, you know, always, always kind of busted walls. Penis. <laughs> well, I'm not going to get into it. There's the elephant. Into the There's an elephant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well I'm not going to get into it, but you can kind of cut away. You, this is a good Leave pl- this plug. podcast now. Yeah, yeah. This is a good plug to kind of check out that video if you want to really know know what I'm talking about. Put a link but, in the description. Yeah, link link below. Click the link below. Uh, but yeah, anyway, I directed this uh, this video for Vitaly uh, called Why I Did Porn. And, uh, you know, once again, I kind of just, we had like a, a sheet, a cheat sheet, if you will, uh, between me and uh, I shared with a couple other producers of things that we kind of have to tick off. And I, the way I approach it, I almost approach it like I do filmmaking. Like I have like a certain... I have criteria, you know, we have like deadlines and stuff. And I try to think about like, um, you know, what are, what are the things I should stay at the one minute mark or what, you know, how, what was the, was the thumbnail going to look like? What are the, uh, you know, the first 30 seconds going to look like I kind of script it and storyboard it out, you know? Um, and then, you know, I kind of walk through the process very much like, like, I guess you, you would as a, as a film, like we had a production team, I had an editor, uh, I was acting as a post supervisor, uh, the entire time. There's like three, three, uh, ways we were doing that. So we're in development, we we're kind of going back and forth with Vitaly to kind of tell the story. Um, and then, you know, when we actually shot it, shot it like. We were, I forgot, I think we were using like studio, studio binder or cell text or something where we had call sheets, the whole nine. Um, and then, you know, we distributed it online, like you, like YouTube or whatever. So I, I, we were very methodical going into stuff like that. And we kind of had like, we knew what the algorithm, what, of what YouTube liked. Um, and at the time it, it was good. Now it's hard like to kind of tell that kind of story now because like, you know, YouTube's a little PC now, but, uh, uh in those days it was kind of the wild west. <laughs> as far as what so. was this? As far as content and stuff, yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. Like so, the stuff I would have like now is is completely different from what how I produce. You know, how I'd produce things then would be completely different how I produce things now on on YouTube. Do was it sort of like the thing that created the most attention? Sort of one or like that was what you were going for. Was you know obviously catchy, but you know had ele ele elements. What am I trying to say? Elephants? No, elements of uh, you know why I did porn like that's such a leading sort of th- like title right and especially coming from him so do you think now people are a little bit like okay we've seen enough of these sort of eye catching head headlines and people are like we know it's not that crazy anymore like right. we're kind of jaded by that sort of tactic yeah, or, yeah, yeah. I mean what would you do differently I think people now? are probably still jaded but people still click man that's a clickbaity type title you know one of the things we do now or what we did then i'm still we would probably practice now is that uh you know when we sat around and brainstorm and stuff we actually like wrote things down on a google sheet and we'd all look at it and we'd you know whichever one la- made us laugh the most we would go with that or which one whichever one we all kind of unanimously agreed upon uh because we we're all kind of i don't want to say we we're all veterans but we all had enough like you know hits under our belt to kind of like you know hmm understand how uh the language of whatever platform we're uh using youtube um you know would want so now i don't know what kind of title i guess we probably might might use the same title you know mm-hmm. a lot of his uh here's the thing you know you got to know your fans too like vitaly's fans knew about that elephant and they would bring up sometimes he'd go on a podcast they'd bust his balls and stuff uh, about it and then he just it was just one of those things he wanted to get off his chest you know he's like you know what screw it like i want to i want to talk about why i did that and um, it was honest. I think that's, and that's another approach that I try to take as I try to be honest with whatever it is, you know, I'm, t- I'm talking about or whatever it is I'm trying to sell or whatever it is I'm trying to like, you know, push, push for because, uh, yeah, man. Um, that, at the end of the day, I think that's what, uh, that's the type of content that really resonates to me is this really honest or truth where you, where you see something, the truth, you know what I mean? Yeah. Makes sense. Um, 
as long as it's it's is it if it's true to the artist or true to whoever the creator is the the better it is so um it wasn't dishonest like that that one it was like that one was like a really genuine kind of like came from the heart of vitaly something you really don't see too much he, he's a prankster so you know you see a lot of the, the silly side of him but we are going to tap into something a little bit darker and kind of like a you know elephant in the room if you will yeah um so yeah that's kind of where i kind of come at it like that's and that's how i approach everything you know like it's funny, like he's a he's a prankster slash daredevil or whatever, and I kind of you know I tapped after that was evil, evil can evil, crazy fucking daredevil that everybody looks up to, yeah. right? And uh, I was trying to, it wasn't the, you know, high flying antics or it wasn't like you know Snake River Canyon, it wasn't any of that stuff. That's that's like the veneer of things, but I was tapping into what was why he became evil, why he did the things he did, you know. Um, what what do you think that? caused him like what what do you think created that in him uh, th- uh well there's a lot uh early whew, you're talking about butte montana man like back in the day he was like a coal miner the whole line man he was a coal miner yeah yeah he was like his yeah he was in uh it's called the butte uh uh anaconda silver mine he worked there for a hot for a hot minute and uh would show off shit to a uh, whole bunch of miners keep people entertained um yeah, man, that was like a no frills Wild West type town back in the day, dude. Like, there's like brothels and shit. He would go out, go out, and, you know, hit up some of these brothels. People knew him by his name. Some of these women, uh, there was a number of different bars. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head and his go to bar. It was like the Dumas brothel. I think it's you, you can look this up, check out Dumas brothel in, in Butte, Montana. Whoa. You would frequent there all the time. Um, but something about yeah, this person's life. I mean, can we? I was, I was you... wondering, like, why? Why would he do that? Like, I'm curious, what? Why? You know, I, I wanted to know a little more about that. Yeah. You know, and uh, you see elements of, uh, you know, pieces on what what led him to the next. You know, what led him to, uh, to become evil can evil. Um, so I get more into that in the series. I guess you'll have to find out. <laughs> well, we'll. You'll well, yeah. See for the people, I mean, I obviously up. know about the project, but uh, where where did it start? Like. I, I know you, you you're kind of you were working for this kind of like multi-channel network type thing yeah uh but like who wh- where did you like learn story where did you you know let's go back Way a back. little bit further okay. before you even got to this where i got evil okay. yeah before right. that uh so where did i start um i guess i started back okay here, here here's where it was and it's it's kind of crazy kind of t- i've never really talked about this sometimes like i'm kind of like thinking exclusive <laughs> this, is exclusive. this is funny uh it was actually the uh, i was gonna join the military i was really close because that was something that was like close to i was an 18 i was 18 years old and through eight when uh i ended up moving to south carolina i was a military brat for 18 years so i moved from you know i was born in uh, in off at air force base nebraska i really don't remember that left when i was one ended up going to uh north carolina for a hot second um there's an air force base there moved from there to uh, the philippines was there for like almost two and a half three years and this violent uh, uh volcano erupted mount pinatubo we had to evacuate it was a whole deal it was like i remember that vividly that was one of my earliest uh, memories um and then um uh moved to back to north carolina lived with my grandparents in south carolina for a hot second and then uh moved to uh just kept moving for a long time um lived in england for a while that's why i met adrian uh, he's a military brat as well. Okay. So yeah, yeah, we were we go way back like high school, like uh, I think we were fifteen, and we were like two of three of the audio AV team uh, back in high school. Uh, we we shoot like silly shit during recess, and like you know, just we had like those bulky ass, uh, you know, uh, camcorders or whatever. I forgot what it's called. It's like I had like this JVC one my dad would give me. <laughs> And that's where it kind of picked up on me. That was one of the things that like I started gra- like gravitating towards. Like I would shoot air shows. My dad would be like, "Okay, I'm working this air show." He's like, "This uh, and be you know uh, out on the tarmac just in case shit would go down." And um, he was like, "Hey, if you can shoot the air show for me, because I can watch later, it'd be great." Because I'm gonna be working. I'm like, "Yeah, cool, I'll do that, Dad." So I would shoot the air shows and just kind of like you know learn on the fly. I'd learn how to like you know cut and edit, you know that kind of stuff, and then we'd play it back and like you know, little family gatherings or whatever. And 
um, it was just to me like that was that's when I was like when I seen the reactions of how my family saw to my what I just made that was just yeah, like yeah, on the yeah. fly or whatever. I was like, oh man, that's awesome. I kind of want to do that. That's awesome. And put a smile on my face when I put a smile to other people's faces or whatever. And so um, the only other person I, I had that kind of same like camaraderie or whatever uh, was Adrian. And we had like we shared a lot of the same taste of movies and um, we watched a shit ton of movies together the whole nine. 15, 16 years old. Um, and then I, uh, I went to, I moved in the middle of my senior year, uh, at, in England from England to the cow pastures of Ruby, South Carolina, Chesterfield, uh, high school is where I graduated from technically. Um, and there was no, but no arts programs. I was really close to being a second year senior. Cause like all the arts, like was pretty much non-existent <laughs> in the Southern curriculum. So, uh, like my AV classes didn't transfer over my drama classes. No such thing as drama there. My only classes that transferred were art, like painting or whatever. So, um, anyway, I was a little disheartened, but I still get kept shooting stuff anyway. Um, Thankfully, like I had enough credits. I, this is kind of a weird thing. It's just serendipity. Um, I had enough credits to qualify for a full life scholarship. My grades were good and everything. I was like a, a four point oh student or whatever. And um, so I could have gone to. Uh, there was a couple other places. Like I was looking at. Uh, I was looking at the Air Force Academy. I had an acceptance letter to West Point. I had an acceptance letter to Air Force Academy Citadel. I wanted to join the military because that's all I knew. And I was talking. Um, to my grandfather about this. I also had a scholarship to, to go to USC, the real USC university of South Carolina, not, not Southern California. Uh-huh. <laughs> I love Southern California, but I, I'm a, I'm a Gamecock. So, uh, I had this heart to heart conversation with my grandfather who was like this hardcore green beret. Okay. He was like this, uh, uh, paratrooper back, uh, in Vietnam. Like he's fought in like three wars, actually like twice in Vietnam, Korean war. And then this like this skirmish shot in, uh, Guatemala. Um, anyway, highly decorated soldier. My grandpa uh, was like my idol, right? Same thing with my dad. He was also like military. That's really all I knew. Those are like my mentors. And I had this heart to heart with my grandpa. I was like, should I join the military? Like, I kind of want to do this. He's like, I don't think you should like, that's not you. I think you put smile on people's faces whenever you're shooting stuff. And like, I, I could see how happy you are with that. And I, I think that's what your calling is. You're an artist, Frank, wow. you should do this. And I think like, you know, if you really, if you, ha- you have the discipline to, to do this because of us or whatever, but I think if you apply yourself to do that, um, I think you might go far. I think you will go far if you, if you, if you do that though, just try something completely different. We've, I've already fought enough wars to do this. Your dad's already been. Yeah, we don't need another fight. You don't need it. You don't need to worry about that shit. You're, we've already fought for this country. I think you can you can keep going forward. And uh, I, that took me to heart. It hurt me. I was like, oh man, fuck. And uh, I didn't cry. Well, I mean, I kind of cried about it. I was like, oh man, shit. I thought he was gonna say, yeah, join up. You know, the whole nine. But um, so that kind of spoke to me, and I was like, okay, you know what? Um, if it's my family that's kind of telling me this, like, especially from him, that meant a lot. So uh, I went like full steam ahead, um, took the scholarship at university of South Carolina. And I was very fortunate at the time when, uh, this is again, serendipity. I feel like sometimes I have four scump moments <laughs> in life. There was, uh, that time, right. When I joined, uh, the, uh, tax incentives to shoot in South Carolina were so lucrative. Like we're like very competitive with say like Louisiana or Georgia where the tax incentives were like 30%, right, to shoot there. So a lot of movies kind of came through South Carolina. I got to go on a lot of those movie sets by saying, you know, I'd work for free. I would love to be like, a, you know, I'd work in the props or something. I'd work in art department. You were as like an intern? Or yeah, th- yeah. Okay. I started out as an intern and um, I worked my way up quickly to become like a props assistant. I was the youngest in the union at the time. I don't know what the record is now. IATSE, uh, the International Alliance of Theatrical Employees. And, uh, our stage employees. Yeah. And, uh, I got on one gig after the next. I would always have to like, kind of, I almost dropped out of college. I was really close at a point where I could, you were so busy doing, yeah. Going on to movies from one gig to the other. It's almost like when you go on those, it's almost like a circus, if you will. Like you're always kind of like, you're w- working with the same people just in a different city. And I was like, jump around. anytime w- there was something in Columbia, I would always get on. So, uh, I got to work on like my first one was death sentence with James Wan. He had just come off the success of like, you know, saw and everything. I think he was like 27 at the time, 26. I remember he was young and I kind of, I looked up to that. I was like, Oh man, if he can do it, I can do it. You know, that kind of thing. Um, we got to work, uh, got to see Rob zombie. I think the one that really hit me though, that I kind of resonated a lot from like, they say that you can learn a lot from what not to do. 
versus like what ha- what versus success you learn more from failure this is this is the truth this is probably one of my mottos actually you can learn from failure more than anything more than anything i'll always like that's why i've always taken a uh a, a backseat to like you know entrepreneurs who have always messed up at things like i, I want to learn from those mistakes you know or other filmmakers i want to learn from those mistakes right so there's this film called nailed that was shot almost 10 years ago 2009 i was like a senior and uh man like everything you can think of i got some stories for you this is some good this is good this is good material i remember my first and we're going to commercial now yeah <laughs> <laughs> i remember oh dude this is some good this is good yes and this is kind of like what got my got my gears turning into like you know i kind of want to keep doing this because like this uh it can't go you know downhill any more downhill than that um there's this movie called nailed you can google it uh it's direct written and directed co-written by uh, David R- Russell. He was writing it with uh, Kirsten Gore, Al Gore's daughter. And they were writing the satire about uh, the healthcare education at the time. And it was kind of like Wizard of Oz-esque where what? you take like, yeah, yeah, it's kind of crazy. Uh, it's renamed Accidental Love. You can check it out. Uh, check out like the uh, YouTube video. It starred um, Jessica Biel, Jake Joan Hall, uh, Kirsten, uh, what's her face? Oh man, why am I blanking on her name? I'm blanking. Beverly D'Angelo, that was huge. Uh, there was uh, Tracy Morgan. That was cool. Kurt Fuller, you know, the bad guy from uh, Wayne's World. Um, colorful cast, right? The one that really, like, I never got, like, starstruck or anything. It's hard for me to get starstruck. was P.B. Herman. Paul Rubens Whoa. was on the set. I was like, <gasps> I was trying to keep my cool, you know. I was like, I was working as a prop assistant, so I see him every day. Anytime, like, you know, I had to wear, like, a watch or something, and he'd give me his personal stuff. So I kept my cool, you know, called him Paul. Knew me on first name basis. He was the coolest man. He like sit and eat with the the crew and stuff, and awesome dude. Um, and uh, the first day on set, I'll tell you this: the first day on set was probably the most intimidating. It was James Con, seeing James Con on set, like fucking Godfather, right? Like, like oh shit, James Con and David O. Russell, man, this is awesome. And uh, they fought, man. They had like this like clash. James Con and David O. Russell. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so here's what happened. <laughs> I was on set when this happened. And this is I don't know if this has ever been talked about. I know there was an article written about James Conn walking off set and all that shit, but this was like, here's what happened. It was like, so I had these batch of cookies. I was a prop assistant. I had like a batch of cookies where uh, the James Conn's character had to eat these cookies. He played like the senator who was uh, trying to, I don't, I'm trying to figure out the, the reasoning of the scene, but he has to eat these cookies and to like choke on them and die essentially right in the middle of this line and he's not delivering the line right the way David O. Russell wants it. And so they're going, they're clashing back and forth and he's eating all these cookies, throwing them up in the spit bucket and stuff, which I was having off to the side. Oh my God. So you're I was ready. running out of cookies. And I was like, oh shit, I'm sweating bullets. I'm like, oh man, like I'm going to, I don't know if I got enough. And I'm like, oh, fuck. like I'm just kind of looking around. And then finally, like before, like we ran out of cookies, <laughs> they clashed hard. And I don't want to say what they said, but there was like, Two alpha dogs just like barking at each other to a point where James Conn was like, fuck this, like walked off the scene. You know, I ended up having to uh, give his props back or collect the props back from him later. And you can tell he was just never going to come back to set. He took a first class or took like a ticket back, bought a ticket back to LA one way, never came back. (laughs) (laughs) So so we were fucked for like the next two or three days. We were just like, ah, shit, well, that's a wrench. Like we're gonna have to figure, I felt sorry for the EPM on this one. Um, And then we, you know, ended up having to move to like the next scene or the next location or whatever. Uh, And they recasted him with the, with James Brolin, um, Josh Brolin's father. And uh, did he do the scene? Okay. He did. He did. He went all right. Like I remember the day of. Like I was everyone's like, like oh, this fuck, is gonna what? go down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was crazy. That was one of like we shut down production. I th- I lost count. Like we went to double digits the amount of times we've shut down for various reasons. Um, a, a lot of it kind of came down to funding, I guess. Like there's a lot of I don't know. I don't want to get into it, but we shut down a lot, and it was the most I've ever seen. I've seen uh, production companies, or I'm sorry, I've seen like productions where it, it would shut down just once or whatever. That one was just like it happened so many times that I was kind of worried about how this was going to turn out. Yeah. And uh, I learned, man, uh, David Russell had a lot of patience by the end of that. I mean, he didn't end up taking the credit for it. I think it's like if you're looking up on IMDb, it's. Uh, direct written and directed by this uh, fictitious name stephen green he didn't david o russell didn't want anything to do with the project um 
and uh, the producers wanted to you know edit it themselves or something and i don't know i don't like there's a lot of different rumors the movie didn't end up it was on the shelf for like years like it we we knew we were going to see that that cut it wasn't until like 2015 or 16 when it finally got released i think it was, went straight to vod and uh uh yeah it was renamed accidental love instead of nailed and yeah it was just one of those like holy shit like i learned a lot from this project more than anything and i kind of like you know i was like anytime i approach a new project i was always kind of like thinking back on you know what was some of the things that kind of messed up from that project that i can you know retool or whatever if you will communication the whole nine um so I started from then I started uh, doing my own content. I stopped. I could have kept going to be like a props assistant. I could have kept going. Yeah. I kept like climbing the ladder. Yeah. Yeah. I could have worked my way up to be like a production designer if I wanted to, but um, I didn't like, I just wanted to produce my own content. So I started switching gears. I ended up becoming like a marketing producer at a TV station, um, WTOC in Savannah, uh, Georgia. Uh, I had a friend that was working there. said, you know, we would love to kind of get your, your take on some of these commercials and stuff. So I would just grind on just shooting a shit ton of commercials. Like, uh, I'd handle like maybe five to 10 clients a week. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was like really quick, fast paced environment. That's why all those, a lot of those local TV commercials are really shitty. <laughs> Cause it's like day, like the day like you have two days or yeah. something. And usually the client is like, especially if it's like a car dealership and shit, they already know what they want. So you're just in there just like they shoot their shit. And, um, you know, they want a quick turnaround time. Like I remember like Dan Vaden's Nissan. If you want to look this up later, there's another one. Dan, v click the link below on this one. Dan Vaden's Nissan and uh, Savannah. Jer yeah. I will never forget this guy. This guy was insane. The car dealerships local. are the craziest. I mean, if you look, if you look at them, car dealerships are just like they're so like, ah, you know, and they got a you know close up of a dog or like they have all these cars spinning on some weird things. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah, you're shooting on the uh, on their lot and everything, and it's just it's just funny, you know. In my head, I'm just like, okay, I'm grinding, you know, to get all the technical stuff out of the way. But here's what I was doing: I was doing that by the by the day, and I would save up the money I'd make from that to shoot my short films over the weekends. At the time, I was dating someone who was going to SCAD. Savannah College of Art and Design. And she was uh, like a grad student working her way up to be like a director and everything. And I would help produce a lot of her films. And we were both the same age. I was like 24 at the time. And it was assumed that people assumed that I was a SCAD student. Right. So I'd sit in some of these classes like what? cinematography. I would check out equipment. It got to a point where I was like editing shit. And they're like, you know. Like, who is? Do you know who that guy is? Yeah, yeah. No, he's, he's, he's here all the time. Though. Yeah. Yeah. That's like, pretty much what it was. Yeah. I got to know a lot of these people by name, like, like John, uh, I don't know if he's still there or whatever, but I got to, I got to meet like the checkout guy. Um, I would, I'd, you know, rent equipment. They, ch I check out equipment all the time. They just assumed that I was a student. Um, so here, here's a funny story. Um, there was like four short films that I shot with SCAD through SCAD students. Uh, some of my best friends and, the one that really like propelled us or propelled everybody that worked on this project is this movie called The Secret Number. And I, I produced this with uh, my good friend, Colin Levy. He was uh, also a SCAD student at the time. And uh, I just tapped all my resources. Here's what we, we got away with murder on, a lot, on this movie, um, like in terms of, you know, sets and uh, logistics, like we were just covered. Like I had free food, all the uh, clients that I had worked as a marketing producer, I was like, Hey, uh, like I remember I, I shot shit, shit for uh, Chick-fil-A once. I, I asked the Chick-fil-A general manager in Savannah. I was like, Hey, uh, you think you can like hook us up with some Chick-fil-A lunch? You know, you can, it's a tax write off. If you do this, um, you know, it would save us, I don't know, $500 for for food he was like, yeah sure as long as i can come to set that'd be dope man you know i can i can i can write this off he was also You're like, like i'll put you in the fucking movie yeah 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 i'll do whatever <laughs> give me more chicken yeah I <laughs> <laughs> seriously I, he was like no I, there was one guy who wanted to throw us like it's funny we were using uh like a I forgot what it was. Oh yeah, yeah. He owned like the bar or whatever, and he wanted to. He, he was a guy like that owned multiple things in the in in Savannah. He was like, is there any way he had this Vespa dealership? He was like, is there any way you can get the main character on a Vespa at some point when you're traveling this? Blah blah. blah. He read the script. And I was like, ah, I don't know if we can do that. It's just, uh, I don't know. He's like, instead of this car, can it be the Vespa? And you know, kind of some yeah, product kind of placement. Like, yeah, he wanted straight up product placement. <laughs> So I kind of like, that was my first time. I was like, oh man, brokering that kind of relationship yeah. and shit. So I utilized all my Savannah contacts to make this fucking short film happen. And it was so good. And so like, I didn't know it was going to get the success it did. Like we ended up winning a lot of like film festivals and shit, including, this is a funny one, including the Savannah Film Festival. Um, so here's what happened. 
the day of the the director start just started working at Pixar um, during the uh, it was like his first week at Pixar when the uh, Savannah Film Festival happened, so he couldn't come back to to do it. So I would rep- represent on the film's behalf as a producer, and uh, we want all the short film. Everybody that was in this category were all student films or whatever, right? You had to be a student. And when Secret Number One, like everybody assumed that I was like a SCAD student. So I went up in front of 2000 people <laughs> and accepted this award on behalf of SCAD on behalf of SCAD. <laughs> and I kind of, I said, thank you, SCAD. I didn't say, you know, I, I said, thank you to How did no SCAD student. Left? Nobody knew except for like four people in the audience that were laughing. I can kind of hear them out loud laughing. And, uh, you know, I was, sh- I was shaking uh, Professor Hofstein's hand. He was like the cinematographer, uh, professor and you know handing the award off to me and everything i was like oh my god these people don't know it's kind of weird and uh but here's what happened i mean that short film kind of got us uh at the end of the day um got us uh our next gig you know i ended up getting like after that i had the opportunity to work for a couple producers out here and this is what got me out here um there was a producer that uh she was like one of my first producer mentor she saw what i did for almost nothing she's like man i need to get you to work on some of the stuff i'm working on and uh you know see if you can help us you know logistically make some things happen and yeah so i came out here did worked for her for like learn the ropes of how this industry worked for the first six months and then when that production company is called reveille by the way um just being transparent it's up the street from here but by, by the way like i just feel like a couple blocks man i've never left this area wow yeah it was on ivar and uh Reveille, i was trying to get onto the set what was it? oh the office the office was like my favorite show but i got there right when they were shooting in the last season so i didn't get to go or whatever i got to like run an errand over there but i didn't get to go on set i was like Fuck. so um i was working for uh uh two producers uh her and then uh, this other guy How- howard t owens he's like this huge ho- head honcho and he was brokering this deal with another production company to kind of merge and stuff and I felt like I wasn't really grinding on my own stuff when I was working for him. Like by the, by the end of the day, it was like, it was such a breakneck, you know, production company that I get in at eight and I'd come back home at nine, 10 o'clock. I didn't even get to work on my own stuff. And I felt like after, you know, right when they were merging, there were, you know, some people were going to leave and some people were going to stick around, blah, blah, blah. I was like, you know what? I need to leave. I need to kind of do my own thing and try to do that. I feel like I know, I know myself now to like try to work on my own projects if you will and that was around the time i met like uh i met ty lopez and i met like uh i met her met him through uh through a fan uh, a friend um i met uh, uh a whole bunch of different entrepreneurs at the time and i was like oh well you know these people are tr- trying different things you know i'm gonna see if i can you know help shoot their stuff um i'm gonna kind of take what i knew back at wtoc from marketing and from yeah yeah I'm gonna, yeah and- I, exactly i'm gonna i'm gonna take what i learned from that and kind of apply it for their short form content and um to kind of pay the bills and i knew i wanted to kind of write too i, I felt like i was a you know i didn't i wasn't having any time to to really write for you know my myself um I wanted to work over at, uh, I was literally, I remember it was lunch when I was trying to make this decision whether to, you know, keep moving with this production company or do my own thing. I was walking, I was just taking a long walk down Ivar and I went to like Amoeba, just kind of looking around there, just like bought a DVD or Blu-ray at the time. And then I ended up going, I was about to go see a movie. I just asked the, the guy, I was like, hey, you guys hiring? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, yeah. And I was like, what, what positions you guys got? And uh, they're like, oh, we got this, 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 and then projectionist. I was like, what? Get the hell out of here. And I, I was like a projectionist uh, for a hot minute um, back in uh, <laughs> so back then, in college. Oh, back yeah, yeah. in South Carolina. Yeah, back in the day. And uh, I was like, you know what? I think I could do that. Like, I remember I got a lot of shit done. I got a lot of homework done when I was a projectionist, cause here's, here's what, uh, back in those days when you're working projection, I mean, it's probably like dead now a lot. I mean, you're only pressing a button, but you would, you know, you would have a set where you play like 40 minutes worth of movies or whatever. You just go one projector and next and next and next. And you're doing th- checks and stuff, but nobody ever bothers you in the booth. You're by yourself. It's a very lonesome gig. And between each set, you got three hours, two to three hours sometimes of just like dead, you know, not doing anything. You can run errands. You can go downstairs, check, you know, do your theater checks and make sure everything's cool. But, um, most people would like read or most people would like, you know, uh, I don't know, do their own thing. What I would do is I would write my own screenplays. I would end up like, you know, uh, produce my own short film projects. I would edit commercials and stuff. And this is around the time I met you. I was doing spec commercials yeah. and stuff. And uh, that would be the time I would allocate, you know, to work on myself. It was almost 
honestly, ArcLight was more of a film school than SCAD was or like anything else. Uh, Cause like I got to learn a little bit my, my, my taste and my tone and stuff. And I was always hustling for the next spec commercial, hustling for the next thing or whatever. And I got a lot of momentum doing that uh, to a point where, you know, I, I eventually, uh, I ended up quitting, you know, I got, uh, I got to a point where I was doing so much spec commercials or I was getting on to a whole bunch of different gigs where I was like, okay, I could just do this full time. And um, it caught wind of, uh, and then Ty, Ty kind of broke out and, you know, he blew up. Um, I ended up bringing, that's when I brought Adrian in, Adrian and Josh. Uh, cause, uh, I kind of told him there was a point where I was doing a lot of content for him. I was like, uh, and they, they wanted me to see if I can come on a little bit more full time. I was like, I like doing a lot of other things too, though. You know, I wanted and to shoot other like, content. But I have these guys. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, I know these guys and I, I know, I know I've known Adrian for a hot minute. I know he's reliable to do all this stuff. He's, he's very, te- you know, skilled. You just have talented. to feed him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly yeah and that's that's Beat how they give him that's some how they came on board yeah <laughs> exactly uh and and that's how i i got them to come in and, wow uh, so if it wasn't for you doing that for adrian, adrian we wouldn't be here me. yeah we wouldn't be here yeah we probably wouldn't be talking to each other thank yeah. you for quitting the art because <laughs> that got me You're here welcome. yeah exactly yeah one thing leads to another isn't that insane inception bro it's insane that's a, that's, that's insane. So yeah, that's kind of how like that kind of happened. I remember when, um, and I still, I like to be in my own, you know, I like, I just like having my own schedule and stuff. But and what I, was, I, I mean, the, the, the time spent writing in those three hour time blocks or whatnot you were dedicating to that. How did you like, what, what, what advice would you give for people that maybe have even just an hour or don't even have an hour, yeah. but they're, you know, they know they want to have, they want to work on themselves and work on projects for themselves. Like what, was something that drove you to do that work and continue and not feel like this is a waste. What am I thinking? Like, yeah. I'm, it does, you know, like work workshop it, man. Um, one of the things I would do is, uh, I would share my scripts with other writers that I trusted and that had a good voice. And sometimes they were brutally honest with me. And, uh, I like that. I kind of welcomed that with open arms whenever a writer was like, Hey, this doesn't make sense. Blah, blah, blah. They call me out on stuff. Now, if it's someone that didn't know what the fuck they were talking about, you know, I'm like, you know, whatever. But, um, you learn from other, you know, other people a lot. Like even I've, I've noticed this, like, Oh dude, here's a good story. Like the Brat Pack, you know, the Brat Pack, Spielberg, Scorsese, uh, Brian De Palma, uh, man, uh, uh, what's that guy's name? John Milius, my favorite. He's my favorite, like one of my favorite filmmakers. Um, you know, the opening crawl of star Wars that, that didn't come from George Lucas. Guess who came up with that? Out of that entire Brat Pack. De Palma? Damn. Yeah. It was De Palma. He was, they were the first, one of the first test groups. I think it was the very first test group uh, for, for uh, George Lucas to kind of screen this. He trusted these filmmakers a lot. And it was Brian De Palma. I was like, what the fuck is going on? I don't know anything. He was really ripping it to George Lucas. And the only guy that was actually really like kind of understanding or whatever was, was Spielberg. And everybody was just ripping Star Wars. They're like, this is for kids now. And then George, Brian De Palma just like, kind of like shaking his fist, kind of paraphrasing everything. But he's like, you got to have something at the beginning to like kind of really spell what was going on. Like, I don't know what the hell's going on or whatever. So George Lucas took that note. Now you got the fucking opening crawl, which is iconic to Star Wars. Yeah, the sound. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you got the opening crawl. That's Brian De Palma's idea. So, um, you know, you, you, you kind of have to have a circle that I, from that lesson, I learned to have a circle of friends or who are writers or, you know, filmmakers that have a good track record of and taste, you know, and they could have different tastes, completely polar opposite tastes. I have friends that are completely polar opposite for me, but it, you know, I give them something. I kind of, I want brutal honesty like that, like the way Brian De Palma was to George Lucas, you know? So, uh, that's something I kind of learned early on. Um, so while, so here's the thing, here's an advice. Like if you don't have, whatever job you're working on, like say if it's a part-time gig, like I did at jump cut, or I'm sorry, not uh, jump cut. Um, at, uh, uh, even at jump cut, I was kind of writing some stuff on my own though. Mm-hmm. Like I was like, I was getting up earlier every day. Here's, that's a good one. Um, right after, uh, arc light, I had the time there, right? Like at that gig. Cause I had like two hour breaks, if you will, I had time to do stuff for myself, you know, and I would discipline myself to, you know, accomplish this. And I'd actually write out, you know, I had, I'd set deadlines. That's a big thing. Like to avoid pra- procrastination is set deadlines, you know, have a date for everything and like cross shit out, you know, um, kind of approach it like a, uh, and you know, this like approach thing, approach your craft, like a mad scientist, you know, like experiment, you know, don't be afraid to experiment. I think this is something kind of causes a lot of artists 
you know, artists are very, you think artists and uh, scientists are very much different? No, no, no. It's actually very much the same, same type of method. I apply like the, you know, the scientific method to all my projects, you know, if this isn't working, okay, let me try this, you know? Um, and uh, I feel like a lot of projects end up getting stalled, you know, stalled because of that, because they don't know how to like experiment. So I got to experiment a lot at Jump Cut. Like we knew what started to work and what didn't work. And I started applying that to my own projects. But since that was a full-time gig, I would wake up earlier. I'd wake up like, you know, four thirty, five o'clock in the morning. And I'd have like two hours to dedicate strictly writing to myself. I wouldn't do anything else. I'd block off everything, block social media. That wouldn't even have my phone next to me. You know, I just had a timer. That was it. And I just said, okay, here, here's the two hours that I need for this product to move forward. Um, so to kind of segue this, I was working on a project uh, for South Carolina. It was a South Carolina film grant. I was awarded a hundred thousand dollars to tell the story, this crazy story about Ron McNair. You know who this guy is? No. Okay. It's another one of those things that kind of, it was a Forrest Gump epiphany that kind of happened while I was on a walk and <laughs> very much like our <laughs> Uh I was, uh, it was like one of my last times walking on uh, the South Carolina, Uni University of South Carolina grounds or whatever. It's right next to the state Capitol. And there's this giant monument of uh, African-American history from is well, on the beginning end uh, there's like you know african americans on the cotton fields and stuff you know it, it's a deep south to at the end there's like this shuttle that kind of takes off i was like what the hell and there's like this uh, a giant monument of this other guy ron mcnair i was like what the hell who's this guy and i started digging into it and it turned out he was not too far from didn't live too far from where i you know my family live um so this is place outside in south carolina arms uh, outside of charleston uh in the height of segregation, 1959, there's a story about a nine-year-old black boy who was trying to check out a library book at an all-white library. Okay. And it was insane. Like they didn't, they didn't, he kind of caused an uproar. The librarian didn't know what to do. Um, became like this battle linguistics because, you know, they just, the librarian was like, no, you, we can't really do that because you're black. You know, it got, it really got kind of like heated. Um, some half the people in the library kind of understood the librarian, but half the people in the library were like, no, this is like this is kid. He's just trying to check out a couple of books. So they were kind of pushing, pushing this kid to uh, check out these books. It got to a point where the librarian ended up having to call his mom. Oh, I'm sorry. Call the cops first and then call the mom. To try the mom of the kid. The mom of the kid. Not his mom. Yeah. Of Ron McNair. And uh, uh, the cops come there first. And Ron's like, where's the law about this? I don't know. There's, there's not a law against, you know, people my color to check out a library book. I don't understand it. It's like, well, it's kind of, it's an unwritten law. It's like, you're not supposed to do that. You know, you're not supposed to be here, blah, blah, blah. And sorry, kid, you can't, you can't really do that. And they, wow. you know, they just say, it's, it's, just, it's not a law that's written. They kept saying that, right? And librarians just like, you know, racist. So the mom comes in and instead of scolding Ron, I'm sorry, instead of scolding the librarian, she scolds Ron because she, for fear of them getting, you know, yeah, some the worst case situation, situation being lynched or something. Yeah, exactly. Inciting some kind of crazy violence or whatever. So, um, Ron just completely like almost gives up and he just walks, you know, he's about to walk away and, and uh, he's like, you know what? Okay. They want to break a, a law. He kind of turns around and he says, okay, so wait a minute. If you want to talk about laws here, when was the last time that book was checked out? The librarian's kind of like looking around. Okay. Checks the mass head. Hasn't been returned in a year. There's a law in South Carolina that if a book hasn't been checked out in over a year, you get to keep it, at least at the time. And so, like Ron calls him out on that, and everyone's kind of like, "Uh, uh, shit." <laughs> Librarian's like, "Fuck!" Discards the book, passes the book off to Ron. Uh, it's a couple books. It was one on uh, uh, John Coltrane's music, uh, sheet music. He's a f music fan of John Coltrane. He's like just popped off at the time. Um, a Carl Sagan book and uh, 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 Robert Heinlein's uh, newest book that just came out. Robert Heinlein's a sci-fi writer, two sci-fi authors and a, uh, jazz and a jazz book. And he got to walk away on that freeze frame on the library at the end and kind of like do this uh, uh, gangs in New York esque, like passage of time, time lapse of like, shoot, I'd shoot it in black and white, one, th one through three anamorphic aspect ratio, and then kind of like broaden it to, uh, you know, two, th two, two, three, five aspect ratio, turn to color, and then kind of like do, do a dolly back of this monument of an astronaut, Ron McNair. Whoa. And then on uh, uh, text over this image, we'd see nine-year-old Ron McNair checked out these books, book on uh, astronomy. 10 years later, he's the first African-American 
to uh, first African American to receive an MIT degree in physics. Three years later after that, he's one out of 2,000 applicants to be accepted into the NASA program. He was supposed to be this the first African-American in space. Um, he ended up catching a cold, so somebody else went. But uh, he ended up being the first musician in space. So there's a shot, I'm sure it's still in textbooks to this day or whatever, of Ron McNair playing the sax like John Coltrane. In space? In space, in a space shuttle. Oh, my God. It's an insane story, right? <laughs> it's an insane story. So I was going to do this and I was going to do it for $100,000 for, for South Carolina. So I was working on that for about a year until uh, Nikki Haley. This is why, you know, I'm not really a fan of most Republicans kind of hit me personal, but um, Nikki Haley pulled the plug on me, cut funding to the arts. Uh, I was one of the first ones on the chopping block and uh, it was something I couldn't control. And it was like, <gasps> fuck, I just, I felt like I wasted a year of my life developing this. My first like real taste of failure on a personal level that it, like deeply affected me. Like, cause I, I checked off like a lot of things. I had pretty much gotten the rights from the family. I had spoken to his widow. I had spoken to his brother, Ron's brother, Carl. I had like, you had your script. I had everything ready. Yeah. I was ready to go. I had, I, I coordinated with Panavision to, to shoot it with a grant. They were going to give me 60 K worth of equipment to like shoot this on film, blah, blah, blah. And like, I was just, I was devastated, man. It hit me hard. And I was like, I'm going to take it out. I'm going to figure out another project to kind of work on. And, you know, I, at the time I felt failure, nothing but failure. And that, that resonated, uh, all the, all the stories that hit me, it was evil story as, uh, that hit me on how you can take failure and turn it into something bigger. That was the next thing. That was the next project after. Wow. That. So, uh, when I read that bio, I think it was recommended by Ty, actually. There was a number I talked to him about that. He's like, maybe you should read this book, you know, on evil, um, Lee Montville book. And, uh, I'd pitched it. I remember right. Another situation where I was kind of uh, talking it, uh, talking to it with another co-writer who ended up becoming a co-writer on this project about evil. And what really resonated with his story to me was just how he took one you know, he fu all his major milestones were all fuck ups, like big fuck ups. Caesar's Palace, the Caesar's Palace jump, like he tumbled for 40 feet, you know, he smacked over uh, on the pavement and went, you know, had he stopped in the parking lot across the street from Caesar's um, and, uh, you know, he had a concussion and everything and he uh, broke all like shit ton of bones. He's He's gone down as like a guy's, I think he still holds the Guinness Book of World Records as a, a guy's uh, who's broken the most bones in their body and still live to tell about it. Oh um, so every single jump he did, he always like fell and broke his bones or he's just like, he'd never really landed a lot of stuff. Now that said, he has landed a lot of jumps and stuff, but his major jumps in his life, like everybody kind of knows him for or they whatever. Crashes. Exactly. Spectacularly crashes. And that resonated with me. I was like, man, I just had something that I thought was going to be so huge. And I crashed in spectacular fashion. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's what spoke to me. That's why I kind of wrote about evil or whatever. And, um, I kind of like, cause I, I knew what that felt like. And he just kind of, he picked himself back up and got onto the next one and got bigger and bigger and bigger. Snake River Canyon, another one of those, like it, he didn't, he crashed hard, but like, it was like the parachute deployed right upon takeoff, whatever, didn't clear the Canyon at all. And went straight into the ravine, <laughs> the whole nine. You could check that out on YouTube. Oh my God. Yeah. Fucking crazy, man. And that's what the series is kind of like leads up to. I'm kind of giving it a spoiler alert. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, that's like his biggest thing or whatever. Uh, yeah, that that's what kind of drew me to that story. Just like, it wasn't about his like, you know, it wasn't about uh, the veneer of like evil can evil. It was like the st what really resonated was failure. Like that spoke to me. And um, I just wanted to throw that, you know, somehow. Um, the kind of the recipe of, of uh, and the ingredients of what, made the story made sense uh, uh how i could tell the story made sense to me i was like okay through here's your, how we, through your experience through my experience i was like i know how i okay i know what this feels like okay let me see if we work that in there somehow yeah. that's what i did yeah that's what i ended up co-writing uh with that with uh with my partner or my writing partner on that one so um anyway yeah um, there, there's so much there's so much there to like to highlight and and to hear you talk about if you're gonna fail like fail spectacularly yeah spell and, and take it man take it we're we're with a badge of honor i kind of like i kind of do I'm, I'm honestly i'm like i'm okay with that like I've, I've learned this from a lot of other filmmakers too. a lot of other filmmakers that really that have failed in spectacular fashion. some of them don't really like to talk about it but 
I'm okay with that. I'm okay with talking about it because I think that's that's part of the uh, the recipe of growing as an artist. You know, um, no matter what it is you're doing, you're going to fail at some point, or you're going to get rejected. You know, um, in so many different you know ways uh, as an artist, especially in this town, you get rejected a lot, and you just got to get used to. It. You got to love the process. I love it, man. I, I kind of like okay, if I get a no, that's one no closer to a yes. <laughs> that's my attitude about life, man. That's or at least that's my attitude about like. Yeah, you know, pursuing this, pursuing yeah, yeah. these opportunities, here. these opportunities, because one thing kind of leads to another, and I never like, I never try to plan things out as far ahead anymore because of, um, you know, working on that project for a year, uh, on the Ron McNair story, mm-hmm. um, I stopped trying to plan like things way ahead in advance and stuff. I'd always kind of like scale back a little bit more and try to put as much effort and energy into what's in the now. You know, I know it sounds like self-helpy or whatever like kind of weird saying that but it's it's the truth like if i if i focus on like whatever project i'm working on and now how much energy i can put into this as much as i can right now or whatever's due like in the next couple days and stuff that's usually when my best best work kind of happens and flourishes um yeah that's that's part of my thing like i feel like most artists kind of they get too caught up of like i don't know rejection or like um well, it's, I think or, it's, it's the yeah, it's that fear of rejection. If they control it and they plan and they plan and they plan, then they never take that action to be vulnerable and to fail. Yeah, if they're always planning or if they're always like waiting till the time is right. In a exactly. way, exactly, yeah. it just puts off maybe some of that. Yeah, you put you put that in. You don't. You, you're wasting energy doing that. Just just transfer that energy, spending it to a positive, and a positive result will, will happen out of it. Had Ron McNair, uh, had that story kept going at the University of South Carolina Grant, I probably wouldn't be here, dude. Like I probably would be still working in South. I probably end up moving back to South Carolina or something. I would end up like I don't know. I wouldn't have worked on Evil. Uh, I wouldn't have sold a you know a script to to Universal, dude. Like because of that failure led me to that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I don't know. I always count my blessings or at least that's my attitude about everything. Like I never try to like look at anything in a negative light or anything like that. I was like, Oh, okay. That was meant to happen. I need to go in this direction. You know, so you're I need to pivot kind of just to, to catch up you. The project has is starting production. Yep. And now you are working on something new. Yep. Yep. Where where did that idea come from? And and uh, it actually happened on Ty's farm. <laughs> it was in uh, uh, I I took a hiatus a little bit after I wanted some time to focus on myself. Um, and it's funny, usually things happen in both uh, personal and a personal in your personal and your you know whatever profession you're working. Sometimes something sometimes uh, some things happen at the same time, mm-hmm. and that can give you you know some time to kind of recalibrate or kind of pivot you know and, and kind of like figure out what other direction you want to go in and and whatnot. So um, I had a couple things happen to me in my personal life, and at the time when I was let go of of evil on my birthday, by the way, like a couple of years ago. This hurt. It fucking hurt. But it also like it also kind of taught me a lot. It was like. Shit. Okay. And I was ready to kind of move on from that project. I was like, by the time I was at the end of it, I was kind of like, just, oh God, like it was, we were juggling a lot of, uh, we were a lot of cooks in the kitchen. That's all I'm going to say, um, without getting much into it. I love everybody on that project, but a lot of cooks. Um, I, I, here's one of the things if I were to learn back or kind of, I, I talked to a couple execs since then about uh, what I could have done differently or whatever. Uh, that was a project that was, you know, I felt like I was learning a lot on the fly. I wish I could have led more, you know, I wish that's, I didn't look at it as a loss. I looked at it as a lesson. Like, I wish I didn't have to learn so much. Cause we were like, I guess we were kind of positioned to be like showrunners, if you will. And I had never written TV before. So we like, it was originally uh, supposed to be this, uh, a film. Like we wrote it in a very Scorsese, like long form movie. I think the first draft we turned in was like 165 pages. It was insane. Like three hour fucking movie. And um, it ended up becoming adapted as a TV show. And we had just about every network in this town hungry to, to hear our pitch for it. I pitched Netflix, HBO, Showtime, um, uh, USA Network, USA Network is the one that ended up buy, buying it. Um, I pitched to Hulu. That was that was that was pretty cool. Oh yeah, go for it. No, that's just oh, my, that's just my timer for us. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I ended up pitching every network in this town. Now I was just kind of like, uh, uh, you know, wow, that's this is awesome. Like I, I kind of wrote a lot from that, but at the same time, I was learning a lot, and I felt like now I can I feel like I can lead to 
whatever next project I'm working on. I'm not going to learn so much now on the next project. I always learn, learn something, but I was full time like learning on that project. So, uh, uh, this next project I have, uh, I, w- w- it was during my time of like when I was taking a hiatus, uh, I was kind of looking at other true stories. I kind of want to get away from true stories though, but I was like, you know, I also listen to true stories. And, um, I came across a story, uh, Oh, what is that noise? Sounds like someone's climbing. He's got Spider Man like, over here. <laughs> yeah. Spider Man's trying to move a fridge up the yeah. outside of the building. I don't know what's going on, man. Sorry. So you yeah. had um moving on to the next project. Yeah, yeah. There was another project that kind of spoke to me, like one of those things that like, was an epiphany type situation. Uh it was loosely based on a true story. I ended up kinda like fictionalizing it in my own version and uh, kinda had you know, without giving away too much, I kinda sp- spun a little bit of my own personal life into this and uh, you know, once again I kinda just spoke whatever was true to me and it's still true to me now like because i'm currently working on it i'm pitching it i just pitched it uh uh a couple places last week and universal i just pitched that uh in january um you know i i have been very grateful about this entire process and i felt like this might this makes the most sense is i'm supposed to tell this story this is the one i'm supposed to like work on right now versus evil i don't have any like honestly like my creative capacity right now for evil this is done. Goose, I'm done. Yeah, I'm done with evil. I'm gonna, at the end of the day, I'll see it on like in the premiere and, and whatnot. But um, yeah, I've kind of like moved on to my my other stuff. And yeah, you kind of have to like listen to. You. I don't know. It's like uh, I think Scorsese says you gotta listen or uh, Spielberg you know, listen to like the your inner whisper. Like every artist has like a whisper to kind of go in that direction. You know, see see where that what with it whether that's in development or whether that's in production or post. Like so there's an inner whisper always kind of talking to you. Like go here, go in that direction, try that. So. That's where I'm at now with this current project. There's like an inner whisper that kind of happened to me on an Amish farm <laughs> of all places in Virginia on Ty's farm. That was like, you know what? Try this out. See where, the, see where this takes you. And um, I'm very grateful. I had a, uh, uh, I had a guy that, uh, that saw my work or whatever, and he, he, he knew me from another guy I worked with a, on a commercial for. He was like, hey, man, I want to I want to invest in a project of yours. Uh, let me know whenever you're, you know, you're ready to, to show me something. And uh, what I did was, is another one of those situations where I was kind of brutally honest with uh, someone he invested in. He think he put in like 200K on this filmmaker. It was this premiere I was invited to. And he wanted to kind of, you know, see what I thought about it, right? The EP. And uh, so he sat between me and this other filmmaker. And I was brutally honest to this guy. I was like, it doesn't mean, I was going to give him a lot of like verbal notes to this uh, this guy and i could see the eye the eyes of the ep just kind of like light up he's like oh shit he knows what he's talking about okay <laughs> fuck <laughs> and that's where he gave me that speech like a little bit uh, uh he invited me like you know uh for like coffee or something uh, a couple days later he's like hey man whenever you got something like, send, it, send it my way or whatever just let me know it's like yeah man uh, i might have something but man, let me see where i can take it you know and i hit him back a couple months later of this project that i asked i think i have something so uh, he invested on this proof of concept that I shot last year and uh, showed it to him recently. I mixed it on the Sony lot, um, had it like I'm very grateful to like a lot of the professional contacts that I've had met along the way. That's kind of been accumulating for the past 10 years. And uh, yeah, it's one of those one of those projects that just kind of threw everything together, uh, everything that I've learned. And and uh, uh, it was an impossible project. It was just, it was insane. It seemed like impossible on paper, but I feel like we pulled it off. Hopefully. I mean, we're in the rooms to pitch it. So hopefully I'm doing something right. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, like, uh, like what I, I, I love doing other like short form content. I'll, Cause I like, I need to get away from that. You know, I find that a lot of filmmakers like to work on different projects. I like to have smaller things in, uh, in the works, you know, I've learned like, man, some of the biggest filmmakers I know, I don't want to like name drop or anything that's a very LA thing, but they have multiple things in the works, you know, just in case something falls apart. My, that was a mistake that I made back in the day. I had all my eggs in the evil basket. I wasn't really writing or doing anything else mm-hmm. um, when I should have, you know? So um, now I have multiple things, things kind of in the works, you know? Uh, I still do a lot of short form content for other folks. Uh, Cause that's just, A, it's a lot of fun. I, I like to get away from my, my own craft, if you will, I got to pay the bills, you know, I got to do all that stuff. But at the same time, I'm like, I have the opportunity to do that. I mean, I'm still at a point now I can, I can turn down stuff. That's really, it's really nice. But, um, I love doing like, you know, just pushing out content for other people. That's it. At the end of the day, I think that's what I'm supposed to do. So, uh, yeah, man. Um, trying to figure out how to wrap that up. Well, but. <laughs> no, that, that was great. My, my, uh, my last question for you is that 
my favorite question I ask all my guests. Mm -hmm. It is called the Life Billboard. If you had a billboard on the intersection of Sunset and La Cienega, you could have anything on there, a message, a picture, a saying. Uh, you know, some people put their Venmo. Like, oh, that's um, funny. Yeah. Like this. For my own Venmo. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> uh, what would yours uh, say? Um, I think I would put it. I would give it in the hands of evil can evil. Actually, one of my favorite quotes of all time. I would ever, I'll probably get this tatted one day. I don't know. But, um, cause it, I mean, it kind of goes into the theme of what my story is. Uh, man, he said this once and I, I ended this on every single pitch when I was giving the evil can evil pitch. It was on the back of, uh, this booklet, like this visual treatment that I had. I think I shared it with yeah, you yeah. at one point. Um, but on the back of it, it's uh, evil can evil right next to his bike and it's like distress and shit. And over it, it's just in giant caps on this like eight by 10 document. Uh, a man could fall many times in life, but he's never a failure until he refuses to get back up. Evil can evil. And I was like, man, that just, that speaks to me, man. Like, I'm like, fuck, okay, get back up, get back up. It's like a Rocky thing, you know? It's silly. Yeah. It's motivation. He's Rocky know? on a motorcycle. He's Rocky on a motorcycle, essentially. <laughs> yeah, man. And I, I like, that's that's the stuff I'm like, man, yeah, that's so true. You gotta get, you gotta keep going, man. Gotta keep going. So uh, that really resonates to me. That's like one of my mottos. I've kind of adapted, if you will. Uh, just because, yeah, I think it's a, that's the fucking truth, man. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. That's the fucking truth. So. It, would, it wouldn't be me. It would be Evil Knievel on the on the billboard that I'm like, that's the quote right there. That's the quote. It's not Seneca. It's not like any of these stoic assholes. It's Evil Knievel, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It could be my Venmo account, I guess, too. <laughs> That'd be nice. But no, no, no. It's, it's yeah, it's that quote. Man can fall many times in life, but he's never a failure until he refuses to get back up. That's a perfect place to end it. Yeah. You've answered all my questions, Frank. Thank you I'm for coming on here. I'm glad to have here. answered them, man. This is, this is great. <laughs> Let me know when you want to do it again, man. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. All right, brother. Thank you. Cheers, man. Frank, out. <laughs> All right, guys. What did I tell you, right? Great episode, huh? Another great one in the can. We're going to put it in the can. Why do they say in the can? Well, because in the film days, they would store films in film canisters. That's why they say put them in the can. Another one another one in the can, so to speak. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, follow Frank on his Instagram. I put a link in the description. You know, you know how that works. Follow Frank. Check out his uh, films coming out, whoever knows when. And uh, enjoy your day.